Amen. Last week, we began looking at the letter to the seventh church in Asia and found in Revelation chapter 3. So let's go back and look at what we've read there in verses 14 through 22. Revelation chapter 3. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Just sort of a review to remind us of what we have studied about Laodicea, we sort of summed up, I don't have any of the things on. <laughs> I just now noticed. Anyway, we noticed that we have sort of summarized as we have tried to do with all of the letters to the churches, <clears throat> to summarize briefly a description. And to Laodicea, truly the description that appropriately fits them is the church that was lukewarm. And we saw how that like, La like Sardis, Laodicea was a city of great commercial wealth. Thank you, Jake. It was known as a banking center. It was known as a producer of fine wool. It was known as a producer of eye medication. And we saw on the map that Laodicea was located about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia, the church that we studied about before this one. The church may have started about the same time as the nearby congregations in Colossae and Hierapolis. And we looked at the passage in Colossians chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, that make mention of that. And just to draw our attention to, in particular, to what those verses says, notice it says that concerning Epaphras, that he has a great concern, and I couldn't see that back there, he has a zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those who are in Hierapolis. We said that <clears throat> Hierapolis was south of Laodicea that Colossae was north, and what was there between those two cities? A great mountain. So hopefully you remember that because that comes in to be important as we look at what this lukewarmness certainly can be pinned to. We looked at a statement in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia that said, Laodicea stood on the great highway at the junction of several important routes. It became a great and wealthy center of industry, famous especially for the fine black wool of its cheap and for the freezing powder for the eyes, which was manufactured there. And we read that mention of the powder, of the eye salve in verse 18. In the vicinity was even a renowned school of medicine. It was in the year of 60 AD that the, church, the city was almost entirely destroyed by an earthquake. But so wealthy was the citizens that they rejected the pro-offered aid of Rome and quickly rebuilt at their own expense. 
And it was a great, it was a city of great wealth with extensive banking operations. We said that verses 15 and 16 pretty much summarize what the church at Laodicea is. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You know, for what we talked about was that a city that was so rich that it could rebuild itself, this would make it an easy target for lethargy and for self-satisfied complacency. And it's these attributes that certainly are described by Jesus in this letter to the church in that city. See, to Jesus, the church at Laodicea was sickening. It was disgusting. And it made him want to vomit because they were lukewarm. And to repeat, the church at Laodicea was the only one of the seven churches that had been addressed that was all bad. Not a single commendation was spoken by the Lord for the church at Laodicea. And the problem, as we just read in verses 16 and 15 and 16, was lukewarm. That was the problem. Neither cold nor hot. Another way of looking at lukewarm is indifferent. Another word, apathy. So they are simply lacking in diligence. And the trouble with indifference is that more times than not, those who have it don't know it. And those who know it don't care. So that we see is the problem with lukewarmness. And they were like the water supply. And this is what we talked about and showed some pictures concerning a aqueduct system that had been made from the city of uh, Hyopolis to the, the city of Laodicea. One of the weaknesses of Laodicea as far as the city was concerned is that it did not have adequate water. And we made a quote from uh, the book of Revelation commentary that Robert Harkrider said, Heminer writes that the mineral deposits in the remains of its aqueduct system lend evidence to the theory that its water came from the hot springs to the south. If this is so, the water would have been lukewarm even after flowing several miles. In contrast, only a few miles away, Colossi had a good supply of refreshing cold water by highly Africa's prized its hot spring water, which helped to administer healing to the alien. alien. But we know that there was a large mountain between uh, Laodicea and Colossae. So that certainly helps us to see why they had to settle for what they did. And this problem of being lukewarm, they were neither cold nor hot. And we talked about this last week. If they were hot, they would have been diligent. They would have been zealous. In fact, that word hot is the Greek word. It's from the root word for zeal or, or zealous. And we find Romans 12 and verse 11, and we looked at that verse and saw two different renderings of it in, in the translation. The King James says of Romans 12, 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The New King James says not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. If they were cold, they would be totally against what was right. One that's cold is spiritually in a destitute condition before God. A person that's cold, he's 
and I use this word honest <laughs> loosely, but in a sense, it's, it's, it's appropriate. He's honest in the sense that he's not pretending to be something that he isn't. And so, obviously, God wanted his people to be hot, to be zealous, to be diligent. But he proposed the honesty of the cold over the lukewarm. And that, of course, is what the church at Laodicea is being called. And here's where we pick up our study tonight. Lukewarm. It's an attitude that's hard to deal with. One who is cold, like we said a moment ago, they are more likely to see the need to change and change. The lukewarm Christian doesn't see the need. And that's what we see there in verse 17. Here's what they, the church that lay out of seal, was saying. I am rich. I'm increased with goods. I have no need of nothing. That's what they're saying. So the lukewarm Christian doesn't see the need. The church at Laodicea did not see the need because of what they thought about themselves. And really here too are something that we can say about a lukewarm Christian. He loves God, but he doesn't put him first. I think that's a good description of a lukewarm Christian. He loves God, but he doesn't put God first. Another thing, he believes religion is good. He believes that it's important, but it, it just ought not to consume him. He loves others in theory, but in practice does very little for them. That's lukewarm. He has good intentions to do better someday, but he doesn't take advantage of the time and the resources that he has now. That's lukewarm. And a Christian that is lukewarm is too, he's often silent about his faith. He doesn't talk it up. He doesn't make it known to others. So I think these are some of the things that can be said about a lukewarm Christian since we're studying a church that was lukewarm. And Another thing about lukewarm and how that it is an attitude that's hard to deal with is that it's hard to see what we are not doing. That's another thing about lukewarm. It's hard to see what we're not doing. We, we know what we're doing, but we're not thinking and not looking at what it is that we're not doing. You know, it's even harder to see that I don't care as much as I should. That's hard to see. And that I'm not as involved as I should be. That's hard to see. That I'm not as dedicated as I ought to be. That's hard to see that I should have spiritually grown more by now. So these are things that are hard to see about ourselves. And this is especially true with a Christian whose apathy has not caused him to quit altogether. So... That's the other, we're talking about a, a lukewarm Christian that hasn't quit. He still attends, he still comes, he's still assembling. He's not quit in that sense, but the apathy that he has, we see how that truly it was something that was a re, 
reproach to Jesus. Now let's look at the reason. We've seen the problem. The problem is lukewarmness. Let's look at the reason. And that we see in verse 17, where we read, they say, I'm rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing, but know it's not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So see, the church was lukewarm because they did not see themselves as they really were. They had a false sense of security. And that's what we're reading and what it is that they are saying about themselves. They feel secure in all of these things. But it was a false security. They thought themselves to have need of nothing. They reasoned that they were self-sufficient since, you know, we said a moment ago, the church, or the, the city was destroyed by an earthquake. Rome offered to help rebuild but the city was so wealthy, they rebuilt themselves. They, they put the bill. And we said, you know, sad to say, but whatever city a church is located, if the members of the church aren't careful, they become to be like the city. They become to be like the environment, the world that is around them. So here we see a church that seemingly is going along with the attitude of the city itself. We're rich. And we don't have any need of anything. So they reasoned that they were self-sufficient since they were rich, and therefore there was no real need to be concerned about the spiritual. And that statement there that we read in verse 6, 17, the King James says, because thou sayest. See, this is Laodicea, the church at Laodicea doing the talking. The New King James says, you say. Well, all of that is, it indicates that in their own eyes, they view themselves to be strong. So they didn't see their real condition. The real condition was wretched. Another word for that is <laughs> deplorable. They viewed themselves in the truth of the matter, not that they viewed themselves, but in the truth of the matter, they were miserable. They were to be pitied. In reality, they were poor. They were in real need. And they were blind. They could not see themselves because of what they said and then what Jesus follows up concerning their real condition. So yes, they were blind. They could not see themselves and they were naked. They were lacking so much. So they were the exact opposite of what they thought about themselves. And not only the reason they were looked warm was because they had this false sense of security, the other reason they were look lukewarm was because they were hardened. The same, like we have the picture given for us in the Hebrew letter. Someone read this Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. So you see some similarities in the letter to Laodicea and the statement that was made about the Hebrews. There's a very, very good likeness, similarity between the two. So really what the church at Laodicea in their lukewarm condition, they could no longer, yep, 
they could no longer be pricked by God's word. They no longer could be moved. You know, we use that word pricked in what those on the day of Pentecost did. They were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles. So the things that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost moved them. It pricked them. But what we're seeing here with lukewarmness as well as what we're seeing with what the statement made to the Hebrews, there's no pricking. There's no being moved by God's word. That's truly an aspect of lukewarmness. So see, it's very possible to allow the word, God's word, to become meaningless. Another thing that we need to be mindful of concerning lukewarmness and the attitude of lukewarmness. When we are lukewarm, the more we hear it preached, the more we hear it taught, and we're not moved by it at all, then it becomes meaningless to us. So we see that reason. And now let's look at the Lord's reaction. Verse 16, verses 19 and 20. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now drop to verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase them. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So we see the Lord is greatly, in that 16th verse that we read, the Lord is greatly displeased with the church at Laodicea. And the King James Version says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The English Standard Version says, I will spit you out of my mouth. And I really like the New King James translation of this phrase. I will vomit you out of my mouth. You know, you're pretty sick when you're throwing up, aren't you? Well... In other words, Jesus is saying, you make me sick. And so the Lord is disgusted with lukewarmness. He's disgusted with indifference on the part of those that profess to be his people. And this statement really is a statement <clears throat> that shows the Lord's complete and total rejection of the church at Laodicea because of their lukewarmness. Remember what we said in the beginning of our study? This is the only church of the seven that, that the Lord had no commendation to say concerning them. So that's a statement that helps us to see that the Lord is completely and totally in rejection of the church here at Laodicea because of the lukewarmness. So, we need to take this to heart. We need to take it to heart and we need to realize how the Lord truly views a Christian being lukewarm. You can call it lukewarm. You can call it indifferent. You can call it carelessness. You can call it slothfulness. Because all those words are in the same pot of what, we're, what Jesus is dealing with here in the church of Laodicea. So, the Lord goes on in verse 19. Rebuke and chastens. That we see is the Lord's reaction. The Lord rebukes and chastens because 
of his love, because of his concern. And his rebuke is not out of being inconsiderate, and yet that's often the way that rebuke is taken, more times than not, by people that are the receiving of the rebuke. But he's not rebuking out of a sense, out of being inconsiderate. He's rebuking them as a father would a child. And the reason a father rebukes a child is for that child's good. It's because of the love that that father has for that child. And so what we can see in all of this is what's stated in verse 20. He knocks and he pleads. See, what we have here in that verse is a picture of the Lord standing at the door and knocking. He's desiring, he's wanting to come in. He's wanting to come in, but He's not going to use force. He's not going to come in against our will. He waits to be permitted to come in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So this shows that though the church here at Laodicea had erred, what this shows is that repentance and hope were not closed against them. All they got to do is open the door. The door is not shut and can't be opened. But instead, the Lord is still willing, despite how disgusting they were, to come in and sup with them. I stand at the door and knock. And so he's waiting for a response. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Those, but all too often, those that are lukewarm are not going to be answering the door. And so, the answer, look at verse 18 and 19. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. So what's the answer? Well, the only answer for lukewarmness is to repent. See, what we read in verse 18, Jesus said, buy from me. See, though they thought they had need of nothing, they were lacking. They needed, the Lord said, to buy gold. And this is spiritual gold. This is not the little element of gold. It's a spiritual gold. They need to buy this from the Lord so that they would be rich. The problem was they were depending too much on the physical gold. They needed to buy white raiment, which is spiritual raiment, so that they would be clothed. They needed to buy eyesight because then they would be able to see. And so the same is true today. We have possessions, we have clothes, we have medical care, and we think we're just fine. And yet, we may be lacking spiritually in all of these areas that Jesus is pointing out. And that statement, to buy, to buy these from the Lord, that means to do what has to be done in order to have them. 
whatever the effort, whatever the sacrifice, that has that effort and that sacrifice has to be committed to in order to obtain. That's the only way they're going to buy in that sense of the word, buy is by committing themselves to doing what the Lord says do. And so what does he tell them to do? Well, verse 19, be zealous. And it's interesting, this is the very opposite <laughs> of the word lukewarm. Be zealous. To be zealous is to be hot. Jesus said, you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm. So now he's saying in this verse, be zealous. And that's the exact opposite of being lukewarm. That is what it is to be hot. And so what do we have here? We have a command. Be Zealous. How much more of a command does it can something be stated for us to understand that it is a command? Be zealous. So it's a command, and since it's a command, it can be done. And we simply do it rather than wondering how when that any and every service that we render to God needs to be done like what's stated in Colossians 3 and verse 23. Someone read this that one. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto Do it heartily. That's the King James. The New English translation says do it enthusiastically, do it with enthusiasm. And notice what he's saying, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So even in our everyday lives, we need to be obeying our employer. We need to be obeying those that are in authority over us, whether it's a police officer, whether it's a teacher at school, whether it's whoever it is. We need to be doing that as if we were doing it unto the Lord. And if we're doing it unto the Lord, let's do it heartily. You know, we talked about in our services last Lord's Day morning concerning the meeting that sometimes we arrive at services with the attitude of a bored student that's about to go into his least favorite class. Well, that's the exact opposite of this word here, heartily, enthusiastically. So we can obey that command. And we do it when any and every service that we render to God, we do it heartily, enthusiastically. And the other answer besides be zealous was repent. Repentance is a change of mind, it's a change of will that results in a change of life. When the lukewarm repent, they will start doing what they have failed to do. Remember we said a moment ago, that's sometimes the hardest things for us to realize about ourselves or the things that we're failing to do. Well, repentance on the part of a lukewarm person, they're going to start doing what it is that they're failing to do. And certainly there is a definite connection between being zealous and repentant. Those are not two totally opposite, polar apart things. They're connected. Zeal, being zealous, and repentant. I like what Barnes had to say on this verse. He said, be earnest, strenuous, 
ardent in your purpose to exercise true repentance and to turn from the errors of your way. Lose no time, spare no labor, that you may obtain such a state of mind that it shall not be necessary to bring upon you the severe discipline which always comes on those who continue lukewarm in religion. The truth taught here is that when the professed followers of Christ have become lukewarm in his service, they should lose no time in returning to him and seeking his favor again. As sure as he has any true love for them, if this is not done, he will bring upon them some heavy calamity alike to rebuke them for their errors and to recover them to himself. So, a lukewarm church cannot, must not, continue in that condition. Because what we see Jesus doing here in this letter is commanding that a change be made. It has to be made. So with about five minutes left, let's look at some lessons that we can learn from this letter to Laodicea. One is the Lord does not want us coasting. That's, that's another way of saying lukewarmness, coasting. Luke 8, verses 13 and 14, someone read for us. So we see how that one of those ground, one of those soils that's mentioned in Jesus' parable of the sower certainly fits the description of one that is lukewarm, and that would be the one that falls among the thorns. He gets so involved, so consumed in the things around him and does not bring forth any fruit. Hebrews chapter 6, someone read this, verses 11 and 12. So we're to have diligence. We're to have diligence and not become sluggish. Not fall into this thing about just coasting in our lives as Christians. Another lesson, we need to open our eyes to see ourselves as the Lord does. And that was, of course, the problem here with Laodicea. We need to see ourselves as sinners with real spiritual needs. And the time is running out, but you have John 9 and verse 41. You have 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10, as well as verse 17. And then you have Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, if you're taking notes. Another lesson we learn from Laodicea is the remedy. And the remedy was be zealous and repent. And that's what we see expressed in Hebrews chapter 12, in verses 5 through 17. So mark that down with your notes, and hopefully, Lord willing, uh, tonight or sometime in the near future, read that. And another thing about a lesson to be learned is the Lord wants to fellowship with any who will open their hearts to him. And that's what we see in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens, I will come in to him. I will sup with him and be with him. And I think it was the comment that Jeremy made last week that this is the fellowship that God desires, the Lord desires. But again, it has to be on his terms and there has to be things done on our part. 
And then two, the reward for overcoming is to sit on the throne. And that we saw in verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne as I also overcame and sit and sit down with my father in his throne. And we know that we will reign with him, as Revelation 20 and verse 6 says, that we shall reign with him. And of course, this is the uh, figurative expression that so many people get hung up on concerning premillennialism. And in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12, if we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So, two weeks from tonight, with the gospel meeting next week, Lord willing, we will have looked through the seven letters to the churches and begin our study with chapter four. Since they're coming in, I have chapter four handout sheets, but I'll put these on the